Well, hello everyone. Welcome to our podcast session about the collaborative work that we've been doing in Lanarkshire to co-design a new mental health service. I'm Hannah. I'm one of the network officers for Scottish Recovery Network and I'm joined here today by our guests Brian and Dom, Sheanne and Thomas who have got their own lived experience, as well as Lucy and Liz from NHS Lanarkshire. So I'm going to come to yourselves first, Lucy and Liz, to start us off. So I'm wondering if one of you wouldn't mind sharing a little bit of background as to why NHS Lanarkshire embarked on the project and what you were hoping to achieve. So we in NHS Lanarkshire um, were keen to design a new pathway, if you like, for people who might attract a diagnosis of personality disorder. Um, we had a, an older pathway and we were looking to, to review it and create something new. And we were very keen to cast the net as wide as we could in terms of getting feedback about what that pathway might, what, what that pathway might look like. Um, so we, we wanted to engage basically in discussion about, about what good services might look like. And we were keen to find out what other health boards had done. We were keen to find out what people with lived experience, um, what their views were. We were keen to find out from third sector services, really just to cast the net as wide as we could to get some, some feedback and some direction to help us create a new pathway. We were very keen to um, involve uh, people with lived experience and not quite sure how to go about that. So I think the Scottish Recovery Network's been really helpful in just having a wide range of um, contacts and, and a, a good experience of how to go about that, 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 that we didn't have, weren't quite sure where to start. And it's been really helpful. I think probably at this point it's be quite useful for me to give a brief overview of our approach and what we've done as part of the project. Um, but just please note that for more in-depth information, there will be a report available um, on our website. So the NHS Lanarkshire Personality Disorder Working Group, Scottish Recovery Network and also people with lived experience, we collaborated to co-design a new mental health service. So the service in Lanarkshire is for people living with complex mental health problems who may attract a diagnosis of personality disorder. So to start initially, we reached out and made connections with local groups, organisations and people, um, also collaborating with them at our information session to identify key issues that people were facing um, and also to help us decide how is it best to connect with people in Lanarkshire and engage with them. So after that, we then offered a variety of options for people to share their views on what matters most to them um, and how the new service could support their recovery. We reached over 70 people who either have their own lived experience um, of complex mental health problems, their family, supporters or carers, and also workers in local men mental health organisations. And once we identified some key themes from this engagement process, we hosted two co-design sessions. Um, these were in partnership with staff from NHS Lanarkshire to turn our ideas into practical plans for the service. Um, and finally, at the end of the project, just keeping collaboration in mind, we reviewed our ideas um, with NHS Lanarkshire and also those who took part in the project and reflected on our approach on how do we include um, people with lived experience in service design. At the heart of it is a real commitment from Scottish Recovery Network to ensure that lived experience is at the heart of the mental health system. Um, collaboration and lived experience is truly central to our work and everything that we do. So I've got a question now for all of our guests. So why do you feel it's important to include lived experience? I think with some mental health problems or illnesses rather, um, early intervention can be stifled a little bit because um, there's trust issues between people like doctors and nurses and the patient because you, I mean my first experience say, being in a, like a psychiatric ward was um, it was pretty daunting and I just didn't trust anybody um, obviously the early intervention thing is important but if you're not straight with your doctors, your nurses and all the rest of it, then I would say that you're probably not going to end up getting treated for the thing that you should be getting treated with. 
I don't know what it's just that it's like the first time you go into like a uh, a ward or that it's like every move you feel like it's being assessed and if you're suffering from paranoia which a lot of people do then it's not a nice experience uh, I think uh, with lived experience you're more likely to be a bit relaxed and open up a little bit more to, to the person that's uh, got the experience rather than to a doctor or whatever. I think it's important because we, my experience growing up as like a teenager having mental health issues was quite negative. So I think just like talking to people who have lived experience, you're going to be able to see what things need to change. Mm -hmm. And I just kind of don't want anyone to go through what I went through growing up. So I think being able to tell people like this wasn't helpful or this was actually quite traumatizing for me. Maybe you can try and rework it is really important. I think it's important um, just to, if you're evaluating the services, <clears throat> excuse me, that you're providing, you've got to have the people that use the services input into that. Um, but I agree with Dom as well. You can have a bit of a, when you're in hospital, you can have a bit of an other them, other them type of mentality. And, um, and obviously for your treatment, you need to be as open as possible. So, um, but then having lived experience, people beside you um, is really important. Like peer support people um, is really important. But all that comes under an umbrella that you've seemed to have developed with the NHS and with the lived experience and with third sector organisations. So it seems that I was really impressed when you went to your engagement meeting. I've been fortunate enough to get involved with this charity and uh, they've been good to me so it's my way of putting some back into the community and helping other people because if, oh, yeah. if it was for this place I, I don't know where it'd be I'd be I don't know where it'd be so I, I'm just happy to help other people it's really essential I think to have people with lived experience and an on, engage in an ongoing way I think to hear you know from the, the, the person who's receiving the service or the you know um, the, the, the treatment what they think of it's absolutely essential, you know, and um, are we getting it right or what are we getting wrong? How can we, we change things? Um, as a clinician, I'm interested in it. I've um, like a lot of years doing work in groups and I always feel that groups are very, very powerful when people with lived experience come together, share experiences. Um, and that, that so I've, I've got an interest in it that way too. Um, so, I'm, yeah, I'm really... Um, Keen to, it feels like there's a, a, a shift in how people are approaching service design now and, and you know, a really um, important one towards um, working together really with people with lived experience and not just something that's done and then we ask if it's okay, you know, to, to work together. Fundamentally, you know, we were looking to create a new pathway for people that have certain difficulties and it, it makes sense to us, I suppose that the, the fundamental to that is the views of the people who you're trying to create a service for. Um, and I, I think as well, there's something about alternative perspectives that we come from the NHS. And historically that, you know, that, that, that's been quite a medical model historically. I think that's changed a lot and is changing. Um, but I think it's really healthy for us to seek alternative perspectives, not just people from, with lived experience, but their carers, their family, and uh, third sector services. Um, so yeah, I think fun fundamentally it, it, it's going to help us create, hopefully, uh, a better service and, and have a better informed um, design for that service. It's coming through really powerfully is how much we all value the voice lived experience. And I think that is actually starting to be something that's recognised more widely is just how invaluable it is, like you say, Brian, to have the people that are actually using the service and are going to be getting that care to be involved in deciding what that looks like. I mean, it's just a no-brainer, really. So one of the things that we tried to do for the project was offer people many different ways to get involved so that they could share their experiences. Um, people could get involved through our online conversation cafe events, through speaking directly with organisations they were already engaged with. 
through one-to-one -one conversations and also through our online survey um, at the co-design stage as well. We've done it in person and we've done it online. Giving people options is just really important. And we've done this so that we could get as many people involved as possible. And also so that people felt like they could make decisions about their involvement and how they take part. So I'm keen to come to Brian and Dom now. So I'm going to start with you, Brian. Why did you want to get involved in the project? Um, I was my support worker at LAM H that um, suggested coming along to you were designing a new mental health facility in Lanarkshire and I was quite keen to see what your ideas were and what other people thought that of what they would like, like the, the service to look like um, and I was just keen to have an input really myself because I've never been asked anything like that before. I've just been a bit of a number as a process through my recovery process so I've never actually been asked to have more input into it. Um, so it was really good to come along and just see what other people thought and what the service ideas were. I think I wanted to make it better, the, the experience a lot better, not just for patients, but uh, the workers as well. I mean, there's a, a lot of kind of experience on both sides of the mental health thing for me at the moment. For me, it it's beneficial for me um, I like helping people and even when I'm having like my bad like days if I know that I'm going out and that it's going to be a positive impact for someone else it gives me a little bit of motivation to do that so it was beneficial for me in that way but um, also just being able to be a part of the change so that going forward other people will have more positive experiences um, is something that's really important. Just to help people because it's hard to, it's hard to talk about mental health, mm. especially men don't talk yeah, about yeah. the same as women do. So I've been lucky enough to get involved with us and it's, it's, hard, to, it's hard for me to tell my GP. I was the first person I told. It was hard, mm. that was the hardest, but... Um, what do you think worked well and what were the challenges? Um, Lucy, if I can come to you first. <laughs> Gaining sort of meaningful feedback from people with lived experience is actually quite hard uh, for NHS services. And I think we've relied, um, again, historically on sort of paper and pen feedback questionnaires. And what's been fantastic about this project has been there's been discussion, there's been engagement. It's not just been that historical, what do you think of the service, where you tend to get people that have had a really good experience or had a really bad experience. It's quite polarised. So it's been really nice to have um, discussion with, with people. And, and what this project's enabled us to do is to um, reach people that we wouldn't have been able to reach on our own. I mean, I think you said there's over 70 people that, that we were we engaged from a whole variety of backgrounds. So for us, that has been fantastic. It's It's been something that we wouldn't have been able to achieve on our own. The breadth of perspective that we were able to hear from um, was really, really helpful. And we didn't want to do something that's maybe just tokenistic, or, 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 you know, um, just maybe um, very selective or something that wasn't going to be an ongoing uh, involvement. I think the third sector contacts were really, really helpful to hear about. There's quite a few projects I didn't know about, I hadn't heard about, you know, beyond maybe Sam H, Lam H, Lanarkshire Links. There was lots of other ones. Um, it's really interesting to hear about. Um, I think it was helpful to get um, some perspectives as well when you, the way you, you had set it up so the NHS wasn't involved in every conversation cafe and there was this nice maybe um, coming in in a very neutral way maybe if people have had polarised experiences in the past which is really helpful to then help them feel comfortable sharing their perspective as well. Um, and I think I also learned a bit, you know, about your use and engagement with social media, which is different on the NHS side, but it was very helpful to learn about. I think for me, what worked well was offering people, you know, the variety of options for, for taking part. I think it showed people that, you know, we really do want to hear from you and we'll meet you where you are at in order for you to take part. Um, is just to take a step back and remember how important human connection is. I think that sometimes as workers, we feel like we've just got so much on our plate. And especially in the online world, we're flitting from one meeting to another so quickly. We're not having that time at the end of a meeting to, you know, just chat to somebody. How are you doing? How's And for me, with this project, taking an extra couple of online meetings with somebody to build a relationship and build trust with them 
before they come along to one of the conversation cafes or before they come along to one of the events, it was massive. You do care and they're not just another number. Like you actually have that connection and that bond with someone. Um, and I think we overlook sometimes how much building relationships with people. That is a great resource in itself. <laughs> I, I, I give me something to concentrate on. I mean, uh, sometimes as you sit in here and get bored, 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 bored. And... You know, it's gave me something to really think about and how to make it a lot better for an experience for a lot of people. Um, I think, um, I think it's worth listening to people who have had the experience of the the a mental health system in Lanarkshire. So, um, that's really just about it. I felt listened to for like the first time when it came down to it um, because we got out like I got the paperwork mm -hmm. and it was kind of about like what the, the plan is so like in 10 years what would um, a mental health like service look like and I've been saying for years like I don't want to be looked at as if I'm broken and need to be fixed because that isn't the case like I'm never going to be the person I was um before everything that I've been through but being able to say that to different people of third sectors NHS things like that and for them to acknowledge that and be like that's actually a really nice way to put it it was so good to just be listened to in that sense and be with people who've also experienced certain things so I don't think maybe I'm just being crazy by thinking this but other people being like no like I agree I've felt something similar so having that was really helpful for me the same as that but just it's nice to the people are interested because it was a taboo subject for years wasn't it mental health mm -hmm. we just put people under the carpet so I'm hanging it's yeah. just now that people are more open about it now and um, I was just quite impressed that that as, as well as in involving a conversation between ourselves and the NHS and the alert subsector. We um you you've you followed up on that by providing a report at the end of it. So it felt that we were genuinely listened to and there was a genuine conversation going on rather than just being ticking boxes or or, or that kind of thing. Um, so it did feel like a, a it felt really positive, I must admit. So I was I'd be quite I'm usually quite cynical. <laughs> I felt quite um, positive about it, so uh, just the fact that we, I, I felt listened to, so that was good. Thanks so much, Brian, and I think actually you bring up a really important point, which is something that we will always do, you know, and it's something that will we'll encourage our partners as well, is that, you know, if you're asking someone with lived experience to come along and, and be vulnerable and share their experience and share what they think needs to change, you then have a commitment back to them to show how are you using that information. And like you say, it's not just a box getting ticked. You actually, if you're going to be inviting people along, you need to have the right intentions. And it's because you do genuinely care about what they have to say and you value their experiences. And I think that's that is massive, you know, sending the report out. I mean, it's something that's overlooked so much by by others sometimes that you know you're doing this piece of work anyway and actually you should be including the people that made that bit of work possible so send them the reports send them the write-ups let them know what's happening with their experience and what they shared and it's okay sometimes to say it's taking a wee bit longer than what we thought or it's a bit of a slow pro process but just by keeping people updated it shows them that they do, you do care about their involvement so that was a really good point to make thanks for for sharing that Brian. Yeah, I think I was involved with one of the online conversation cafes and I think being present um, on that call and just seeing the range of contributors, um, it made me realise, yeah, we're doing something right because we've got, I mean, you'd set it up, but there was a real range of, of people present and it, and it wasn't run by us. There was something quite powerful about hearing feedback about what we were trying to do as an organisation but it not being run by us. We didn't have titles, we didn't have lanyards, um, which again had been your advice. So it felt like quite it felt like quite a safe environment, but it felt like when we were genuinely getting some meaningful feedback from a, a, a variety of contributors and, and, and that really was what we'd hoped for. And so I felt like 
taking part in that conversation, Cathy, um, we were really seeing that. Yeah, I was thinking of the time in the information session at the beginning of the year, and it was on a, a an online platform I wasn't familiar with. I was a bit anxious about, um, you know, starting what what you know um, would a, 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 what would it be like, um, and just not wanting you know to get let people down. I think as well that um, you could see how valuable lived experiences were all sort of interested and in, um, and not wanting to get it wrong somehow. And you know when you did the icebreakers at the beginning, there was this lovely warm that came over when Louise was asking people, you know, just introduce themselves and um, what made their hearts sing, I always remember asking. And it just brought this lovely human side to the engagement as we started off um, the, the, the project. And I think that coupled with, you brought a lot of knowledge and a lot of um, professional um, a, a, a information really about projects that you'd done in the past and pointed us towards that and it just really came over as you bringing your um, information professionalism as well as this very human approach which was lovely. So we're now going to move into the final part of the podcast um, where I really want to talk about the future of lived experience engagement. So I'm going to come to yourselves Lucy and Liz first. Um, how will you continue to include and engage with the voice of lived experience in the work that you do? Maybe the first thing to say is that I think the, 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 the values were very much in line with what we would hope to deliver. There were things that came out about it being trauma informed and, and person centred and a whole person approach. And these are very much kind of values that, that we would share. So so that was that was quite nice to, to read. Um, I suppose the challenge is always in the delivery um, and, uh, you know, Things often don't happen quickly in the NHS because it's a big organisation. There are decisions to be made, there are finances to be agreed and so on. But I think what we'll take forward from this is, is hopefully an ongoing um, communication and relationship with the Scottish Recovery Network. We've already agreed to have a review meeting um, in, in a few months time. Um, and we're also very keen to follow the, the recommendations of the Personality Disorder Improvement Programme Group. I think they're Come, they're maybe reporting next year um, so so there's a bit of that we're, we're still finding out a little bit about other boards and what what they're offering um, so we we'll very much want to use the outcome of the report going forward in our work as a as a PD um, strategy group in NHS Lanarkshire um, it's difficult to be more concrete than that I think at this at this point um, but it will certainly be a, a major part of our design going forward, a big part of, of, of what we, we hope to implement going forward. We might not be able to include everything. I, I know that there were ideas about drop-in centres and so on, um, and, and, and they're all lovely ideas, but I suppose the feasibility of the NHS maybe won't stretch to some of them, but certainly the, the values and the, um, the, the, the sort of hopes behind them, I think we would hope to incorporate. I think the only thing that I would add to it is that I just really value it um, not only as, as going forward with strategy but just things that you particularly about the trauma-informed practice and things that um, it adds weight to what I do in my own life as a clinician, the people I supervise, the people that might teach, you know, um, and it helps with that as an individual and also as part of the strategy group. I'd always want to advocate for the findings of the report um, as we, we don't hold a budget ourselves or anything in, in the strategy group, but we can advocate as much as we can for um, people's voices um, that's been heard in this report and want to support you know, the, the, the trauma informed practice and um, the findings there. So, What would your message or top tips be to other NHS services who want to better engage lived experience in service design? So I'll come to you first, Lucy. You mentioned earlier the, the value of human connection um, and I think what's made this project so successful has been building up the relationships. In, in many ways it reflects some of the feedback about the report, it's building up trust, it's flexibility, um, uh, it, it, it's sort of feeling that you have shared values um, and I think the Scottish Recovery Network um, has enabled us to do all of that. I think there is a real value in using a non-NHS organisation actually to, to help us um, in, engage in getting some, some meaningful feedback. Um, and I think that the, the range of ways to provide feedback was a big plus as well. Um, so you were great at, at using um, social media, face-to-face, -face, telephone, um, online, 
um, there was a real range um, which which I think really maximised uh, uh, feedback. And I think uh, maybe as part of a previous point is is just us being aware of the power imbalance that can occur um, just by being part of a large organisation like the NHS, where people have had you know different experiences of. And um, it was really helpful for us to have that highlighted and, and, and for the Scottish Recovery Network to help us um, navigate that um, in a sensitive way. Um, yeah, I would definitely say don't try to, you know, for other clinicians um, wanting to, to, to engage people with lived experience, don't try and just go it alone. Definitely go to some like yourselves, like an organisation that has experience with it and a wide range of contacts and, um, yeah, not be scared to, to get involved and to, um, to, to just go for it, I think. Yeah, definitely. So valuable. Absolutely. I think that's probably the hardest part is taking that first step and getting over the fear of getting stuck in and getting involved with it, which makes a massive difference. So thank you both for sharing. Advice would be listen to people. Don't look at them as an issue to solve. Because even if you've got five people who all have the same condition, they'll all have different experiences with it. No, can, no one's experience is the complete same and mental health isn't a quick track progress like you could be doing so well for months on end and then an event happens and it sets you back and if you don't listen to when that happens you're going to keep trying to push them forward and they're just going to hit like a block mm -hmm. and it's just going to stall and it's going to make them feel like so vulnerable and they're going to feel like they've made no progress and it's going to set them back so just listen don't look at them as their condition look at them as a person who wants to be able to go forward deal with what they've been through and live from it instead of forgetting about it and pretending it never happened listen and not judge mm -hmm. That's that simply, and I, I just say don't judge people. You feel good one day, and then maybe somebody died or something close friend or something died, and it knocks you off track again. So it's it's what progress really. Uh, I think you're going to have to train some people. To be honest with you, I, I, uh, there, there is one problem with um, lived experiences that that if the person isn't trained to say the right things, it can lead to some other things for the person that he's um, actually, or he or she, sorry, is actually talking to because um, some, like, uh, mental illnesses kind of have, like, a, oh, what's the word I'm going to look for? It's kind of like a jigsaw that, that, that you never seem to finish. That's, um, especially with schizophrenia. No, that's my experience anyway. Thanks so much for sharing that. I think it is important that you're saying it's important to have the right person doing the engagement and that's what's going to make the big difference. I think um, just to bring in as much of the third sector as possible um, because I think that's how it's worked this time with the NHS going to you and then you reaching out to the third sector. You've, you've got a broad, you've broadened the horizons, if you see what I mean. And... Um, but got a bigger pool of people to cut to to of who have got lived experience. So I think that's my tip, just to involve the third sector as much as possible. Me. Absolutely. I think collaboration is key in, in all of this that we do. Um, I think for me, you know, my advice to other services and organizations who want to truly meaningfully engage with people who have got lived experience is just to be clear from the outset why you're wanting to engage, you know, is it because you want to develop something new and you truly value the contribution of the people who will be affected most by what you develop? Um, and then I think my final tip, which I've kind of already covered a wee bit, is just to remember that building trust and relationships is one of the most valuable resources that we can have um, as part of these projects. Um, kindness empathy and truly listening to people doesn't cost a penny and it makes the biggest difference when it comes to engagement I've found. So we're now at the end of our podcast and I want to say a massive massive thank you to Brian, 
Dom, Lucy and Liz for all of your hard work and your commitment to this project. You know, we truly couldn't have done it without you. Um, and thank you so much for coming along today to share your learning and your experience with others. Um, it's really been insightful to hear from you. Um, I've certainly learned a lot from today and I'm sure that others will have too. So thank you so much for your time.